Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So many of the gospel stories begin uh, in the same way. Some version of this, like we heard today at that time, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great throng and had compassion on them. So often he's in a crowd, and, uh, and so often he's having compassion. It's like kind of the regular beginning. This is like the normal story. Um, things that are different in this story are pretty dramatic, though. Uh, if you remember, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the story of the two demoniacs that were in the tombs, and they prevented people from even passing by that way to get to the town. And Jesus cast out the demons. You remember they went into the pigs. The pigs went down the hill and drowned. And uh, when Jesus was there with those two demoniacs in the right minds, the whole town came out to meet him. And then the twist, we didn't expect, the town sends Jesus away. And I had said, what we normally would expect is Jesus healed all their sick. So we have kind of the normal story, but what the twist is in this story is the disciples say, send the people away. In the demoniac story, the people sent Jesus away. But in this story, his disciples are saying, you know, we're in a really lonely place here. Send the people away, and Jesus won't hear of it. He says, they need not go away. For the crowd who followed Christ out into a lonely place, and they're without food. Now, I don't know if you've ever actually been hungry. But I went camping a few years ago, and I had been reading all the ultralight books about how to camp with less weight on your back. Because the year before, I'd taken, like, Marine Corps weight, like 70 pounds, and it killed me. So I thought, I am going, like, and people are really into this movement. They'll cut the extra straps off their backpacks and cut the toothbrushes in half. Like, they're just dropping ounces of everything they can. So I didn't go that far. But I thought, you know, I don't really need to bring that much food. In the morning, I could have a granola bar. At lunchtime, I could just eat gorp, you know, like peanuts and M&Ms and stuff. And then I'll have dinner. But what I didn't realize was that I had gone like total calorie deficient. Like I was getting like, you know, 600 calories a day and backpacking, you know? So I was laying every night in my tent hungry, like a dummy. <laughs> And I don't know if you've ever been really hungry, but that's the situation the disciples are trying to avoid here. It's, we're way out here, we're run out of food, you know, send them into town to get something. Like, they're gonna start getting hungry and then not nice and stuff, you know, and, and weak and all kinds of stuff. And Jesus knows that it's, it's, they're not in that kind of situation with him, that they're relying on him now and that they're gonna be fine. They're relying on him for survival. They've withdrawn to Jesus. They've gone to him. And uh, they're just following him. And St. John Chrysostom says this. It was as if the crowd was riveted to him. Not even John the Baptist's tragic end diverted or frightened them. So great a thing is earnest desire. So great a thing is love that it overcomes and dispels all danger. Whatever they were facing, they were, they were fine. They were with the Lord. As long as we can be, as long as they can be, and as long as we can be with Christ, really nothing else uh, can affect us. Nothing else even matters. What we see is a few things from this crowd. And the first thing we see is that they're really sacrificial, this crowd. They believe that the Lord uh, wants them with him, and they're willing to sacrifice at this point, being hungry, to be with him. It seems to me the Lord is always asking for more sacrifice, not less. And not sacrifice like as a punishment or something, or because we have to earn his love or something. Not that kind of sacrifice. Like he'll like us if we sacrifice. Not, that's not the truth. But out of love, asking more sacrifice so that we will grow in love. Love for him, love for others, even to learn to love ourselves. That sacrifice is always asked of us. So here we are. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven, blessed and broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples. 
The disciples gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. We know the story really well. It's like one of the first maybe miracle stories you can really remember is the multiplication of this lunch into feeding this giant, I mean, a crowd that's so large. Um, a throng, it says, a throng of people, thousands of people. Jesus is healing their sick out of compassion for him, from, on them. His compassion doesn't end with the body, although it's the body that he uses here first. You know, he's teaching both the soul and the body in a way. He's teaching the soul, and then he's feeding the body and feeding the soul. It's really an incredible thing. He's moved with compassion. So on the first thing we said is that the crowd is sacrificial. They're willing to sacrifice their own comfort to be with the Lord. Second thing we see is that the crowd is in need of compassion and love. They need compassion and love. Jesus is fulfilling his high priestly role here to give them compassion and love. We see him, you know, take the, the, the five and the two and break it and distribute it to the disciples who distribute it to the crowd and gives them compassion and love. Not only with the food, of course, but just with his presence. It's really quite something. The crowd is in need of a blessing because they don't have much. And he will bless what little they have. In many ways, we're like this crowd. You know, when you read the gospel story, you're always trying to figure out, like, what's it saying, right? Because we're not reading any of the gospel stories like, well, this is like a historical account only, and so I'm reading about something that happened on, and, you know, it doesn't say this. Because if it did, it would be like historical, like on a Monday. Like, it never says, on Monday, Jesus was walking. It always says, and then, usually. And the next thing, and they went to this town, and this happened, you know? Because it's not written like like a diary. It's written like the gospel, <laughs> the words of life. And so it's written for us, too, as much as it's written for anybody. Us this morning in, in this place. And what is it saying to us, you know? And I, when I read this, I really thought that we are like this crowd. We're also like the disciples. We're gonna have to get to that, too. <laughs> In, this, in the gospel story. We're like this crowd, and we're asked to be sacrificial. We're like this crowd in that we're in need of compassion and love. And we're like this crowd in that we need a blessing on what little we have. This is where we are. And the Lord draws close to us. I've been involved in a, many Orthodox churches in our life in, uh, in the faith. And before and during and after seminary, and um, well, just two after seminary, I guess. In 2012, seven years ago, uh, we started the journey to get to this place from the strip mall on Main Street near Val Vista. We came here with about 50 families and about 250,000 bucks. It's quite a lot, actually. Uh, but we didn't have any equity or anything like that. This was just scraped everything together. And now, seven years later, still on a journey uh, to, again, to a new property. We're pretty sure we're going to start the process here and, and get into it. But that looks like that's what's going to happen. And uh, we don't have that much money, by the way, now, but we have a lot of equity. And uh, we have this incredible property, both the one we have now and the one that's been given to us. And we're about twice as many people. And with us, you know, it takes all of us as a community. You know, we don't have like, a, you know, a church of a thousand people or something where a whole bunch of people can be involved and a whole bunch of people can't. We just aren't that kind of place. And I hope that we never become that kind of place. Because something is asked of every one of us individually, not only us as a community, and then we'll talk about that in a second, but us individually, something's asked of us. For all of us to give, actually. Uh, that's asked of all of us to give, both financially and of time. You know, in our in our in our talents, to administer, to lead, to direct, to help with coffee hour, counsel, sing, serve, greet, teach, cook, clean. Um, everything's asked of us here to sacrifice ourselves, our time, our talent, and our treasure. <laughs> The Lord seems to always be asking for more, not for less. 
And in fact, there's tons of like gospel stories of the, I mean, uh, Desert Father stories where they've been praying all night and an angel shows up and says, the Lord has heard your prayer. And he says to take a break. <laughs> and they, it's like without fail, they make the sign of the cross or they say something like, who am I to take a break? <laughs> and the angel <laughs> disappears because it's not an angel, not sent from the Lord. It was like the temptation. You can take a, you know, you've made it, you've arrived. You know, take a break. And that's almost like never from the Lord. Not that he's driving us hard. It's not that. It's just sacrifice is always asked of us. Always asked of us. To fulfill the Lord's will. We're like the crowd in need of compassion and love. We're like the crowd with a blessing that we need. We need a blessing on what little we have. And for many of us in our community... Um, we've suffered losses of our jobs, our homes. Um, we have other troubles, health issues, and that's going on like right at the moment in our community. And so something is asked of us to care for each other. St. Paul, in his incredible beginning of this uh, epistle reading, I appeal to you that you'd all agree and there'd be no dissension among you, that you'd be united in the same mind and same judgment. And then he talks about the quarrels they had been having after that. He's like, come on, be of one mind. We're really coming off an incredible Sunday last week where we were of one mind in that vote for that new property. Absolutely amazing, astounding. And, uh, but St. Paul's arguing for the next thing, be of one mind just on everything, not just on a new property or something, as good as it is, but be of one mind on everything. The real twist in this gospel story is when Jesus says they need not go away, you give them something to eat. And this is where we kind of look, can look at ourselves as a community as more like the disciples in the story rather than the crowd. Because he's saying to the disciples, you, you give them, you don't have to send them away. I'm not going to send them away. Give them something to eat. Which they are completely unable to do, just so we're clear. They, they do not have the power to do that. There was no part of them that could have had like a couple of committee meetings and figured out how to feed the 5,000 families with the lunch. It's impossible. It, I mean, the whole thing is impossible. But they actually have no power to make the impossible possible. They must rely on the Lord. That's the only option they have. You give them something to eat. And they kind of panic, you know? And one of them says, well, we have like this boy's lunch. All right, that'll do it. They have to be just kind of astounded that the hard work wasn't figuring it out. It was just coming to Jesus and going back to the Lord. Well, we have this. All right, that'll do. We'll make that work. We don't want to take our eyes off the Lord as a community, individually and as a community. We want to keep focusing on the Lord to say, well, what do you have for us? So let's rely on the Lord. You know, let's rely on the Lord. What's going to happen for us as a community? The Lord's going to ask more of us. And there's going to be the hungry and the thirsty and the tired and whatever that we'll be asked to care for more somehow. I'm sure of it. How? I don't know that part. <laughs> Will we? Yeah. So then as a community, can we stay together on it? You know, and trust the Lord with it. Give him, give him whatever little we have and let him bless it. I was reading early this morning from a book called um, uh, The Watchful Mind. I think I mentioned this before. It was a book that was written a couple of hundred years ago and then lost 100, 100 something years ago and cataloged in the library at Xenophantos at the Monastery of Mount Athos. You know, some anonymous monk wrote this great book about prayer and they said, great book, and they you know, put a number on it, put it on their shelf, and then it was never read, you know? And then it was found, and now it's being translated, and St. Vlad's uh, translated or had it published in English. And this is what I read this morning, what I'll end with this morning. Our sweetest Lord Jesus seeks to help us to keep us with him and fill us with sweet compunction and rest. Compunction is kind of a, a little bit of an old-fashioned word for us nowadays. Compunction is like the awareness that we've sinned. There's like a kind of a guilt feeling that says, sin, I've got to turn back to the Lord. It's almost, and also kind of the energy to turn back to the Lord. It's not only like, I feel bad about what I did, but it's kind of like turning back to the Lord. I realize I've done something wrong. 
and I'm going back to him. And the author calls it sweet, sweet compunction. Not the kind that leads to despair and pulling away from God or something, but that kind of sweetness like, I need to go back to the Lord. So I'll start over and I'll read the rest of it. Our sweetest Lord Jesus seeks to keep us with him and fill us with sweet compunction and rest. He is almighty and all powerful, and we are filled with sweet compunction and rest. Considering that his name is holy and sweet to his friends, but fierce and bitter to demons, you are filled with sweet compunction and rest. Considering that our Lord is hymned by the angels and glorified by the archangels and praised here in Mesa. I wrote that. <laughs> Hymned by the angels, glorified by the archangels, and praised here in Mesa, you are filled with sweet compunction and rest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.